The Bible makes it very clear that God's ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. And when the COVID-19 came uh, to the world back in 2020, many people thought this is going to be something very, very terrible. terrible. Of course, it was very terrible for many. Uh, but for us, it was the, uh, the key that unlocked the door for a church uh, to be started in a small little town called Ambuichadahaba. Uh, if you want a tongue twister, you can try to say that six times fast later today. Uh, but that's the name of our town. That's the name of the city that we're working in. We're working in the capital city of Antananarivo. Uh, and inside of the capital, there is a small town of Ambuichadahaba where there are thousands of people uh, who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ before. There are churches, there's religion, uh, but there is still no truth of the gospel. And so in 2020, after COVID-19, as we had mentioned in the video, we just did a simple food distribution to kind of help uh, relieve some of the stress and uh, the, the, uh, the problem, uh, a lot of the problems that people were facing. And uh, through that, God really started our church. And for the last three and a half years, we've been growing steadily. Uh, we've seen several people come to know Christ as their Savior, baptized, uh, and then add it to the church as we see in the Word of God. And so it really has been a great privilege for us uh, to be serving the Lord in missions. And I believe with all my heart that probably the greatest calling that anyone can have in their lives is to be actively involved in missions. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're a missionary, uh, but I've heard it said before, and I think uh, it's uh, something we should all consider. Uh, not everyone is called to the mission field, but I believe everyone should wrestle with the possibility. And I don't know if you've ever stopped to think, what if God wants you to be a missionary? Uh, for most of us, we're happy to send somebody else, uh, and I was part of that group as well until I finally surrendered and said, okay, Lord, whatever you want, I'll do. Uh, but really, it is a privilege to be involved in missions, and um, uh, Mike had already said, Pastor Mike already said, uh, you get a front row seat to see God work in a great way, and that's the truth of missions. You get to go to a place uh, where the gospel witness is maybe not there, and you get to see firsthand what the power of the gospel can really do in the hearts and lives of people that have never heard the name of Christ or have never heard uh, the truth of the word of God. And so I'd, I'd like to encourage you first and foremost this morning uh, to be actively involved in missions. I know this church is already doing a lot for missions. Uh, I believe you support over 60 or maybe 70 missionaries that are supported through your church. And I know many, I'm sure many of you are actively involved in giving and praying. Uh, but I would like to say, uh, and maybe this, is, uh, maybe this is the wrong thing to say, I, I don't really know, uh, but I would rather have one church full of people that pray for us but can't support us financially than to have a thousand churches that uh, give us uh, financial support but don't pray for us. Uh, we need people that are praying faithfully for the work that God is doing around the, wor uh, around the world. Prayer is the key that really unlocks the door for God's work to be done around the world. And so we need prayer. We need uh, really God's people to really be thinking uh, of uh, the, the missions work that's being done around the world. And so we pray that God, we hope that uh, God would continue to use your church uh, to pray for your missionaries, to pray for us in Madagascar as we go back. Uh, we're just here really for a short furlough of five months, and then we'll be going back at the end of February of next year. Uh, to continue the work over there. Our church is still young. Uh, there's still new believers there. Uh, I would be lying if I said I'm not a little nervous to leave the church behind, uh, but we believe that God is uh, able to continue to the work that he's doing. We're thankful for another missionary that stepped in to kind of fill in uh, our role over there. And so while we're away, the church continues to go on, and uh, we keep getting reports back that God is still working and doing great things there. And so uh, we certainly appreciate your prayers for our church there in Madagascar. We appreciate your prayers for us as we travel for the next several months through the United States and uh, give an update on what God is doing. And we hope and pray uh, that you would be actively involved in missions here or around the world, wherever God would use you. I'd like to just take a few minutes this morning to look in Acts chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles this morning, if you'd look at Acts chapter 16, uh, I'd like to just bring a, a, a challenge or at least a simple thought for us as we consider the world. It's exciting to hear of what God is doing through West Florida Baptist Church and what he is doing through your outreach programs. It's exciting to hear about Trunk or Treat. Uh, like Pastor Mike said, it's just a really simple uh, concept or idea. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that uh, we'll spend 
$1,000 on candy. Uh, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of candy. Uh, but that's an exciting opportunity. Uh, that's a small tool that we can use to reach people. And obviously, you can't put a price on a soul. And uh, it's uh, exciting to be involved in seeing how God is uh, bringing people to Christ uh, as their Savior. In Acts chapter 16, we have a great story as well of Paul the Apostle uh, on a missionary journey as he's preaching the gospel in a city that I believe had never heard the name of Jesus Christ before, and that's the city of Philippi. We asked the question in the video a few moment, uh, minutes ago, how does God start a church? Uh, I'm excited for West Florida Baptist Church. I believe you celebrated 50 years uh, this last year, and that's a long time. Uh, I'd like to know what the story is. What was that first Sunday like here at West Florida Baptist Church? Who came? Uh, who, who was around? Uh, how does God start a church in the world today? In many ways, it, it's not, it doesn't take something great or grand. In a lot of ways, as we mentioned in the video, it starts with just one, one person that is hungry for the truth of the Bible. And Acts chapter 16, that's exactly what we see. That's exactly what we find. We find people that were hungry and searching for the truth of the gospel. And I believe that Acts chapter 16 uh, is still relevant for us, uh, even though it's 2,000 years later. In, in this chapter, we really find three kinds of people that were found in Paul's day, and I believe very much that they are still found in our world today. If you would, notice with me, first of all, the first group of people uh, in, in verses 12 through 15. Acts chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. The Bible says, And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city uh, of that part of Macedonia and, of a, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. And she attended unto the things which were spro spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying... If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there, and she constrained them. Here we find the first group of people, the people that I would call the hungry. Imagine Paul the Apostle Paul comes to the city of Philippi and he goes out on the Sabbath day to a river where there were some ladies that were gathered together praying. Uh, this lady named Lydia was probably not a Jew, but a Gentile, which means the rest of the, her family and friends were probably worshiping idols or other gods in the city. But Lydia was hungry for the truth. She was praying and looking for God. And then the apostle Paul came and found her. He preached to her the word of God. He shared Jesus Christ with her. And the Bible says that she attended unto the things that Paul had taught. She was interested. She wanted to learn. She wanted to know. She wanted to find out more about who Jesus as Christ was. After that, she was baptized and she constrained them. She really persuaded them to stay uh, there in her home where they could really uh, base out uh, of this, the, the ministry there in Philippi. And I believe there on that day, the church at Philippi was probably started because there was just one person that was hungry for the truth of the gospel. When we came to Madagascar, as we showed in the video, we did the food distribution. And I'll never forget, uh, one lady approached one of our team members and had just started to ask about our church. At that time, we had no church, we had no location, we had no times of services. We had absolutely nothing that you would consider to be a church. In our minds, we were still thinking several more months down the road, we'll, we'll launch the church, we'll do Bible studies, we'll do everything that we can to kind of get the church going. But this lady wanted to know about our church, and so we said... Give me your phone number and we'll call you back. We kind of got together real quick as a team. We scrambled. We found a location. We said, okay, this is the time we're going to start. And we launched the church. On the first Sunday, as we mentioned in the video, nobody came. But we weren't discouraged because we weren't really expecting more than one that Sunday. On the second Sunday, the lady came. And we were thrilled to death. The church had been started. God was at work and God was moving. That lady that came that second Sunday of our church has not stopped coming for the last three and a half years. When we left the church, she's still there. She's faithful. Uh, I was talking with her. She's in charge of uh, the New Year's Eve service that we put together, and she's going to get that all together. And uh, she's just been faithfully attending the church. A second lady that we had met around that same time 
was talking again to one of our team members. She started coming to the church about the third week in. Uh, she got saved six months later. She just got baptized this last year. And since then, she has just been faithfully attending the church. From the third or fourth week of our church's existence, she's just been hungry for the word of God. She's been through Bible studies and discipleships. And she's been bringing friends and neighbors and family to the church. She's hungry for the word of God. We did nothing to go out and really look for her. She just wanted to know what is the truth. We had mentioned as well, uh, COVID was working there in Madagascar in many ways. We went into a second confinement about three or four months after our, we launched the church. And so we went to the radio ministry, preached the gospel. We didn't get a lot of feedback uh, during those three weeks or four weeks that we were on the radio. But as soon as the country opened up again and we got back into the church, another lady came and she was also very interested. She came back the week after that, brought her husband. After that, she brought her three children. And since then, they've been faithfully attending the services. What I'm saying is this, people are hungry for the gospel. People are hungry for the truth. People are looking for the truth of Jesus Christ, and you don't have to go far to find them. They're in our communities. They're in our families. People are hungry for the gospel. You know, a lot of times when a missionary gets up and preaches, and I know this because I sat where you are, and I've heard many missionary stories before I became a missionary, and a lot of times you get up and you hear a missionary get up and he shares these stories, and you say, yeah, that's true in your country. That only happens in Madagascar, 10,000 miles away. But here in the United States, things are a little bit different. I can remember several years ago when we were on staff at our sending church, we were out knocking on doors one Saturday morning, and I saw a, a young man that was in his yard mowing the lawn. This is in the United States. He's mowing his lawn. He had his earbuds in, and really, I didn't want to bother him. I didn't want to disturb him because I thought most of the time these guys get a little irritated with you. Why are you disturbing me? But I, yeah, I felt the Lord leading me, and so I approached him, and I shared with him who I was, where I'm from, gave him an invitation to our church. I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, you're not going to believe this, but as I was mowing the lawn right now, I was praying and saying, God, if you're real, send me somebody to tell me about you. That's the United States. That's New Jersey, which is hardly the United States. I, I kid you not. People are hungry for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to believe it. And you know what? This message is not new to me. Somebody before me came and said these words, the harvest truly is plenteous. You know who said that? The Lord Jesus Christ. He said the harvest is there. People are looking. They're hungry for the gospel. They want to know the truth. But we have to go. We have to share. We have to look for them. People are hungry for the gospel. Paul went to the city of Philippi. He went out to this little place where people were praying, and there he found a lady that was hungry for the gospel. Lydia accepted Christ, uh, constrained them in her home, said, listen, start the church here. And I believe the church of Philippi probably started there in the home of Lydia. There are the hungry in our society around us. But consider, secondly, there are the hurting. We find another interesting story here in Acts chapter 16. And we don't, I don't know this for sure, but I believe it with all my heart. This young lady that we're going to read about next was probably the second lady that started coming to Paul's church there at Philippi. Notice verse 16 through 18. Verse number 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. There are the hurting in our society today, in our communities today. Here is a young lady. We don't know how old. Let's say she's 16 years old. 16 years old, and she is fully possessed by a demon. We've seen things in Madagascar that make this story to be very, very believable. 16 years old, 15 years old, and already you don't have control over your mind or over your body, and there is something that is working inside of you that you don't fully understand. 
And what's sad is here is another man that is taking full advantage of this young lady, and, she, and he is uh, uh, selling basically her, her, uh, her prophecies, what she's able to do. Uh, she's some kind of a soothsayer or somebody that's able to see into the future and say things that may happen. And here's somebody that's taking financial profits from this young lady who is no longer in control of her mind or of her body. And what I see in this story right away is a young lady that is hurting. She no longer has the freedoms that we as in Christ have. She no longer has really uh, the, 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 the joy and the happiness that we had this morning as we worshiped the Lord in song. She is under the control of another being, and I believe she is truly hurting in this condition. Just a few months ago, we were visiting a lady in our Uh, From our church, it had been several weeks, and she had come, and so we went to go follow up with her and find out what's going on, what can we do to help, how can we pray for her, and uh, I'll never forget sitting in her small house there. She told us that every morning when she wakes up, she opens the little window that's in her house, and the first thing she sees every morning is some kind of demon. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. I haven't seen it with my own eyes, but I would tend to believe, yeah, it's probably true. We sang in one of the songs there about the power of darkness. It's a real thing. Power of darkness is not just a good lyric in a song. It's a real thing that's in our world today. About two months ago, we had another family in our church call us and ask us to come by and pray for their daughter. She's seven years old. She was completely delirious. She couldn't remember who her mom was, who her dad was. She didn't remember anything about the church, even though she had attended uh, our services, our Sunday school for years and uh, for several years. She was just completely lost. And of course, the first thing that the family goes to is who touched her? What happened? How did she get possessed? Is this a demon? Is this a devil? What is going on with her? And honestly, as a pastor, I couldn't give them an answer. So all we did was we read the word of God. We prayed. We tried to fill that house with the truth of the word of God. And we thank God a few days later, she was completely recovered and everything was, uh, seemed to blow over and it was gone. I remember, I remember several years ago as well, uh, in Madagascar, the custom is when somebody dies, you normally go right to the house where uh, the family is, and you visit with them. You uh, kind of go through a, a little ritual of just kind of expressing your condolences and whatnot. And after that, uh, I was with one of the new believers that was in our church. We had left, and we were going back to my house. And I'll never forget it. As we were walking in the front door, he stopped, and he said, Pastor... Isn't there anything we need to do? I was a little caught off guard at first, and I thought, you know, what are you talking about? We're just going into the house. And then I remembered, yeah, the Malagasy have a custom. They have a, uh, a, a tradition that they do. It's not really a tradition. It's more, I guess, a custom that any time you go and visit the dead, when you come back to your house, you need to build a little fire there by your front door, and you need to step over the fire as the smoke goes up. It stops any demons or devils from coming into your house and following you. You just were in the presence of death, and you don't know if that death is still following you or not, and so you build the fire, you step over it, and the smoke keeps everything bad out of your house. And he looked at me and said, do we need to do anything before we go in your house? I said, no, no, no. Greater is he that's in me that's he that, than he that's in this world. We don't need to fear the devil. We don't need to fear these things. We don't need to fear this evil, this darkness, because we already have the hope of Jesus Christ. But what I want to say is this. This world is full of people that are hurting. They're afraid. They're afraid of the power of darkness. They're afraid of the devil. They're afraid of the demon. They're afraid of the tools that he's using. If it's not the devil himself, then it's one of his tools. Drugs and alcohol, addiction, is something that has gripped the world all around. And he's done a great job to scare people. And here is a young lady that was hurting, that desperately needed help. And Paul came and gave her the help that she needed. Folks, our world is still full of people that are afraid of, uh, afraid of the power of darkness. Our world is still full of people that have been gripped by the tools that the devil uses. And it's our job, once again, to take the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and let them know they can be free. 
One of my favorite passages is in Isaiah 61, verse 1. Jesus used this later in his ministry. He said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. That's our job. We get to take the keys of the gospel to people that are in captivity. We get to be the ones that open the door and say, listen, through Jesus Christ, you're free. You don't have to be in this darkness any longer. Our world is full of people that are hurting. They're full of people that are hungry. The world is full of people that are hurting. And just quickly, they're full of people that are hopeless. They have no hope. They're full of people that are hopeless. Look at the end of the story in verse 25. Verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm. For we are all here. Here is a great picture of somebody that was hopeless. He's just doing his job one night. An earthquake came, an, a natural disaster. He looked down the corridor of the prison there. All the doors were open. He assumed that everybody had, been, uh, had escaped. And so he took out his sword and said, there is no more meaning to my life. Let me just end it. He was hopeless. He had nothing to look forward to. He was married. He had children. We'll know about that later. I'm sure he had family and friends. He had a, a, a community that was around him. But he said, there's nothing worth living for any longer. Let me take my own life. Hopeless. I remember very clearly in 2020 when COVID came to Madagascar. I don't know what it was like here in the United States because we weren't here. But we were in Madagascar I have never seen more hopeless people in all my life. Scared, just scared. Every kind of precautions were taken so that they could save their lives. Why? Because death has no hope. There's nothing in the grave. And so in Madagascar, people were taking any precaution they possibly could to save their life because they had no hope beyond the grave. When I remember that, when I consider that, I thought, what a sad, sad world we live in. That when the smallest of microbes comes to our world, something that human eye can't even see, we truly see the true hopelessness of our world. Today, in 2023, I think things have gotten better and everybody's back to their normal lives for the most part. And you might not see that hopelessness that we saw before. It's still our responsibility, however, to have that consistent testimony so that when the ne next crisis comes, and I believe it will come, maybe not a global pandemic, but sooner or later, a crisis will come in the lives of your family members or your neighbors. When the next crisis comes, hopefully they come to you and say, what is the hope you have that I'm missing? You know, I like to think in this passage, or at least ask you, in your opinion, what is the greatest miracle that took place in Acts chapter 16, or at least in this passage about the earthquake? Some people may say an earthquake. It's a natural disaster. It's, uh, I mean, a calamity that's happening there in Philippi. That's not normal. Others might say, no, 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 it's not that. All the doors actually opened when the earthquake came. That's, that's surprising that each and every cell door actually opened. I would say more than that, when you read the passage, all of the shackles that had bound the prisoners fell off of their hands and their feet. Every last prisoner was free to leave the prison cell. But to me, the greatest miracle that took place in Acts chapter 16 was that all the prisoners stayed. The doors were open, the shackles were gone, and Paul calls out and says, we're all here. I don't know this because I wasn't there. I just wonder if every one of those prisoners went into Paul's cell and said, what were those praises you were singing a few minutes ago? What was that about Jesus Christ? Something unnatural just happened here, and I have no hope, but you do. Could you tell me about it? 
We need to have a consistent testimony before our world so that when the next crisis comes, they come knocking on our door saying, what was that hope you had in Jesus Christ? I need it. I want it. Our world is full of people that are hungry for the gospel. Our world is full of people that are hurting. They need help. And our world is full of people that are hopeless. They need the hope that we have. Friend, I want to share with you this morning, we need to care. There are people that are hungry in this community. We need to care about them. It's okay if you're a little late to work one or two days, if you're sharing the gospel with somebody that's in need. It's okay if you take a few extra minutes at the, at the grocery store to share with somebody that may be looking for truth. You might not know who's truly hungry for the gospel until you open your mouth and begin to share the truth of Jesus Christ. We need to care because there's people that are hungry. There's people that are hurting. And you know what? We need to be a little uncomfortable. Paul's prison cell was open and his chains had fallen off. And what's surprising is that Paul the apostle was still waiting there because he knew somebody was going to need the message that he had. We need to get a little uncomfortable every once in a while so that we can share the truth of the gospel. Paul stayed. And when the man was looking for hope, he said, we're here. Don't go. Don't do it. Don't kill yourself. We have the hope you're looking for. And then there are the hopeless, and we need to be consistent before them. I don't know, but I believe that this jailer was probably mocking Paul and Silas as they're singing away in their prison cells. Maybe he's one of the ones that had whipped them and beat them before. I don't know. A lot of times the hopeless people don't show how hopeless they are until the crisis comes. And when that crisis comes, they come looking for those who have hope. And I pray that God would help each and every one of us to be people that have and show the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. The world needs you. The world needs the gospel, ministry, the gospel that you know that you have. And I pray that God would help each and every one of us to be uh, aware, to be always aware that our world is full of people that are hungry. Our world is full of people that are hurting. And our world is full of people that are hopeless. May God help us to do our part to share the gospel message with those that desperately need it.